so I can send out, I'll, I'm planning to send out the recording and also the slide deck and some handouts. So my name is Adria and I am a career counselor and also a psychologist. And this is the third in a three-part series. I don't know if any of you have been able to attend any of the others, but um, this is our final installment of the grad planning workshop. I love to see faces. So if anybody at any time wants to turn on your camera, you're totally welcome. I think I use it as a, um, a guide for my jokes and I, I can tell when they're not landing well and then I start um, kind of changing them or making less corny jokes. So it might be in your best interest for somebody uh, to have a camera on at some point, um, but you can also tell me in the chat. Um, you can tell me to reel it in or uh, get some better material. Hey there. Um, hi, welcome. Okay, seems like some other people are joining us and I'll just let people in as we keep going. So like I said, I'm really happy to have you all here. I'm going to share my screen. And pull up my PowerPoint, but this is gonna be a pretty casual conversation. Um, I do have some material obviously to cover, but feel free to use the chat. And if you wouldn't mind checking in with my handy dandy QR code, that would be helpful. So for those of you who were not here, my name is Adria Villarreal and I'm a, a career counselor at Texas Career Engagement. I'm also a psychologist. Um, I have a PhD in counseling psychology um, that I earned from Texas Women's University. And I've spent most of my career, all of my career in higher education. Um, most of it in college mental health. A couple of years ago, I transitioned to career development and very happy to have you all here. Seems like there might've been some issues with finding the Zoom link on Handshake. I apologize for that. But we'll, we'll jump right in. So today is, some important stuff. At times it tends to be like um, not the most exciting and sometimes dreaded. So I totally get that. Um, but we're going to be covering, it's kind of a two-part workshop where we're going to be spending half of it on personal statements and the other half on what you need to put in a curriculum vita for grad school applications. So and we're going to talk about the distinctions between personal statements and statements of purpose. Um, because I think a lot of times they're used interchangeably, but there are some important um, key considerations, things you want to have in a personal st statement and ways you want to write a statement of purpose that are different. i um, also going to talk a little bit about process and timelines, mostly just encouraging you over and over to give yourself enough time, um, which, you know, I know is hard. This is a busy time in the semester. I'd love if you could throw in the chat what disciplines you're considering grad school. Um, considering to go to grad school in and where you are in the process if you're applying this cycle or if you're kind of gathering information going to take a gap year. Yay, we have a psychology. This cycle for stats. Okay, thank you. So you're probably right in the thick of things. Okay, economics. Oh, we have a lovely range of fields. I love that. Okay, this cycle. So I got a I got a lot of this cycle. Um, oh, museum studies, that's awesome. Okay, so, uh, ah, okay. So you're probably all feeling a little stressed. Um, I'm feeling that with you vicariously, which brings me um, to my question of using the, using the emojis in your Zoom, like, how are you doing? I wanna, I wanna get a feel for, for the room here today. How's everybody doing? or you can put it in chat. Everybody know how to go to the, yeah. Looking for just the right emotion, aren't you?
Yeah. I hear you, Michaela. I think that's a typical one I see. Yeah. It's kind of crunch time, especially for those of you who are applying this cycle. And I know that um, this is also a busy time for school. Yes. Okay. So we got a lot of similarity. So you're not alone. Those of you who are feeling anxious and, and stressed and tense, you're not alone. And I think that's important for us to remember is that, first of all, and I'm going to say this a lot too, you're not in this alone. There's a lot of campus resources that you can utilize. There are people you can talk to um, that will spend time with you that are paid to spend, that you pay, okay, you pay for these services. So um, that will spend time with you looking at statements of purpose, personal statements that will help you with your CV. So there's a lot of help here at the university. All right, I don't need to remind you, um, but you know, the application is a package, right? So you've got your GPA, you've got your entrance exams, letters of rec, um, everything you've done to get up to this point, and then your personal statement or statement of purpose and your CV. So I just, I don't know, I just like to put it in context. What we're talking about today is one piece of a larger picture, your grad application. It's important, um, as are all of these things, and they also work well together. So if there are weaknesses or strengths, you can highlight things. So I want you to think of it as a, as a puzzle. I wish I could come up with a, a niftier uh, metaphor, but a puzzle. You're pulling all these things together. You're trying to demonstrate to admissions committees that you have what it takes and you're telling your story. All right. So when we think about statement of purpose and personal statement, is this confusing for some of you? Like nods? You can nod. I can see some of you. Okay. This, this, this can be confusing. So, and oftentimes it's interchangeable, meaning that schools will use them in different ways. So first of all, I'm gonna say this quite a bit also is be sure you look at your prompts for each school. You have to look at word count. You have to look at what the question is asking. Um, but when we think about statement of purpose, those are typically for more science-based programs and they wanna really see and hear that research story. They wanna see and hear all about your scholarly activities. It reads different than a personal statement, which um, I, I read something recently that said, you know, statement of purpose, which statement of purpose is looking forward, personal statement is looking back. I kind of thought that was interesting and kind of kind of true, but there's nuance to it and there's more to it. So statement of purpose is all about what you've done research-wise, scholar-wise, and how you're gonna grow that. And you're gonna weave that into your goals, short-term, long-term. Um, you're gonna be very specific about your research experience. Personal statement is more of a narrative, more of a story. How did you get interested in this? What are the motivations behind your interest in a particular field? So like I said, they're gonna, and we're gonna talk about this more. I'm actually gonna look over some examples with you, at least of some introductory paragraphs for each of these. So when we think about personal statement, what are your personal motivations for applying? What are your accomplishments and your success stories? What are the challenges you have faced and overcome? They tend to be less formal and more personal. That doesn't at all mean that they're not like the best writing you've ever done, okay? It's just, they just read different and you'll see as we're talking and you probably know that already from the drafts you're writing. Um, but again, you, all, you have to do all of this in the context of whatever questions they're asking you. You wanna make sure you answer the question. So the statement of purpose is more about your academic strengths and background, your research interests and career goals, your fit with the program, why they should pick you and why you're picking them. And it tends to be more formal and academic. Does that make sense? Questions, feel free to like unmute, throw something in the chat if you have any questions. When we think about what, the, what a statement of purpose is, it explains why you wanna pursue graduate school. It's in your own words. They learn who you are outside of numbers, outside of your GPA and your exams. And it also demonstrates your writing abilities. Like I said, don't underestimate that you're showing your writing skills. So that's why this is so important. 
you're showing your writing skills. Because no matter what discipline, we've got disciplines all across the board. Um, you need to be a strong writer. You need to show that. I have no doubt you all are. You need to show that. All right. So they're looking for, they're wanting to answer these questions. Will you succeed in the program? Do you have experience in this field? Why do you want this particular program? And that's such an important question. Why this particular program? And have you thought about and explored the field? So whether it's a statement of purpose or a personal statement, this basic framework can be followed. An introduction. And with your introduction, so you got to try to put yourselves in the, in the seat of your admissions committee. They read so many essays, so many essays. So you're, I think it's really about capturing someone's interest without being, because I, I think that can sometimes be cheesy or hokey. You don't want to be cheesy or hokey, but you've got to get somebody to want to read You've got to be memorable. You have to stand out. I think one of the biggest things when I'm reading students' essays is I don't want it to sound like it could be anybody. I could just randomly pick somebody and that could be their essay. It needs to be personalized. Even, you know, even the statement of purpose, which needs to be more research focused, that can also, that tells your story, your research story, your scholar story. So you weave in your experiences, your research, your academic, your co-curricular things, your leadership, anything you've done outside of academics. And you want, you want to be as detailed as you can. It's hard because often you have a word limit, right? So one of the most challenging things is that you need to be succinct and detailed. And you're like, Adrian, that's not possible. I know it's hard, but it is possible. It is possible. And it, really what that is, is like draft after draft. This is not something you're going to knock out in one try. And you're going to need multiple eyes on it. Professionals, mentors, friends, family. Everybody will catch something different. Everybody will give you, well, and it's your, then obviously you have a decision whether, you know, how much stock you put in certain people's feedback, but I'm just saying it, people can catch lots of grammatical errors. Remember you have the writing center, we're gonna talk about all of that as well, but um, so it needs to be detailed. Um, for career goals, you don't need to have it all figured out, but you need to have some specificity. Nobody's gonna hold you to it. Like it's okay to a dream, Nobody's going to hold you to it. You're not going to not get your you know, diploma at the end of it because you said in your essay that you were going to go this way and now you've decided to go another way. Nobody, so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to, to be specific here. Goodness of fit. So that's why you and why them. And this also means that you need to tailor your essays. It is possible, depending on the different programs you're looking at, to kind of write one solid statement and then tweak it. So I'm not saying you have to start from scratch by any means, but you really want to be careful because details like using the wrong name, you know, using the wrong program, those kinds of, you don't want to have that happen. And that's why staying organized is critically important, not waiting to the last minute. And I know I'm saying this to you and we're, at, you know, we're, we're getting close. So don't panic. Just remember that you'll probably need a little extra help if you're, if you're feeling kind of really rushed at this point and you'll want to figure out how you can not make simple errors like having the wrong program name in your, in your essay. And then you want to have a conclusion. Sometimes it's helpful to tie the conclusion. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, where you can kind of, you have a theme or you started with something and then you can kind of end that way. It doesn't always work. And this isn't a, I'm not trying to give you a formula, more of a framework. All right, so there are lots of prompts out there, right? But if we think about a typical statement of purpose prompt, 
It's something like, please describe your aptitude and motivation for graduate study in your area of specialization, including your preparation for this field of study, your academic plans or research interests in your chosen area of study, and your future career goals. This one's pretty straightforward, um, at least in, in my opinion. Um, so, all right. It's an example of an introductory paragraph for a statement of purpose. I might not have learned about Professor Norman Rowland's lab if it had not been for the Freshman Research Initiative. This innovative program at the University of Texas at Austin introduces high achieving freshmen to university research. As a result, I worked for two semesters with Professor Rowland's team on the mutation rates and genetic interactions of bacteria. As a young Texan from a very business oriented family in El Paso, I found myself in new territory. Those first two semesters were pivotal in defining my career direction. They gave me the foundation to pursue undergraduate assistantships in two additional research labs at UT Austin, which helped me identify my own specific research interests. Thoughts, reactions? It's got some, it's got some specifics. This is a good introduction. It's got some specifics. It tells a story. It tells a story in a different way than a personal statement would, but it tells a story. Like I said, these are meant to be a little bit more formal, a little bit more academic. Personal statement is a narrative about your motivation to pursue a particular field. A strong personal statement demonstrates your motivation, your skills, and your background that have prepared you for graduate study. Obviously don't include pictures. Um, I don't know, the pictures just, I think the pictures for me just kind of, I don't know. My grandmother was the first political activist I knew. Her form of rebellion was not hunger strikes at the Capitol, rather she used song to voice her protests. Trained as an opera singer in the Ukraine, she sang songs of protest against the communist regime. She had no higher education, but she understood the dangers posed by the governments of Lenin and Stalin. She remembered the changes, both positive and negative, brought, by, brought about by the Bolshevik revolution. My clearest memories of my grandmother are her singing in her kitchen in San Antonio, 70 years after the revolution began. She explained the songs to me, their hidden political meanings and the dangers they had once posed for her. It is this history that has instilled a passion for international policy and leads me to pursue a master of global policy studies. It tells a story, right? Reactions, thoughts? These are both memorable. I think this one obviously is memorable in a different way because it really does tell that personal story. Definitely. So Lauren has a question. Let's see, where'd it go? If your graduate program isn't founded in research as much, what would a good statement of purpose look like? Well, first of all, you want to be sure you're answering the question. So I don't know if the question is more general. If um, that might be good, if if you if you could if you wanted to, you could um, let me know what the prompt is. And we could kind of start there. I'll go ahead and keep going while you do that. Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. We'll I'll definitely come back to it. But one of the things to also remember, and I've noticed this more, is that students also have um, multiple essays. Sometimes they're having to write multiple essays. I don't know if that's true for some of you where you're having multiple essays, right? Okay, so then that becomes challenging, but you have to be sure you're doing the same general framework within their word limit, being specific, telling your story, showing that you can do the work, 
demonstrating your demonstrating. So that's a word I want you to remember demonstrating. You're not telling people, you're showing them through the stories you're tell, telling and the way that you're weaving the information together, you're demonstrating. You want to really avoid things like, I always knew I wanted to be a psychologist when. So absolutely, Lauren. Yes, that sounds wonderful. Um, so you want to you want to avoid those very generic um, and this is a time too where you, you know, even changing the world, you change the world. Let's not, let's not use change the world in our essays if we can help it, right? Um, so any of those like overly used slogans, mottos, even, you know, um, this is not the place for those. So I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of some examples. And some of these are challenging. They're gonna take some thought. They're gonna take some brainstorming. Um, and that's something we do in our appointments as well. So you don't have to have a almost polished draft to come talk to us. You can come with a prompt and we can help you brainstorm. Um, all right. So common mistakes we see people trying to cover too much instead of going deep. It's important in order to, for something to be memorable, we have to know more about it. So you have to kind of dig in, right? Telling your life story or telling something like, be mindful of your boundaries, right? Um, there might be some really personal things that you, that have influenced. And I have no doubt there are, there certainly are for me. This may not be the place to do that. And if you're on the fence and you're not sure, this that might be a really great thing to come talk to one of us about. Um, dramatic generalizations, the I always knew. Um, using the word passion. I don't have anything against passion, but I think sometimes we use these words that don't really mean that much. So instead of using a word like passion, demonstrate it let me read something that I'm like, wow, they, you know, they're really passionate about that, but try to maybe avoid using some of those cliches. Not, not identifying what makes you uniquely qualified. So make sure that you're pulling everything that is unique to you. Remember, this is your story. Yeah, not demonstrating your passion. Um, mixing up schools, we kind of talked about that. These are some of the common mistakes that we see. I can't reinforce it enough, but being sure that you're following this prompt for each school. Um, and if you're applying to a lot of schools, which I know many of you may be, that can get unwieldy. So just whatever you need to do to make sure that you're following, that you're answering the question, that you're answering the question for that particular program. And so we talk about these big things and this, you know, academic writing, but really be sure that you're also editing and proofreading thoroughly. Um, the Writing Center, we can also help you with that, but the Writing Center, that's exactly what they do. Um, and then customizing and tailoring for different programs. So a lot of times, like I said, what students do is they'll write a very strong, they'll write their first one and it'll be very strong. And then they'll just figure out where they need to emphasize or de-emphasize um, what they need to highlight for each program. Seeing how we're doing with time, I imagine actually many of you are probably beyond the brainstorming phase or, or are you? Are, are some of you still on the brainstorming phase? That's totally fine if you are. One of the things you might do then on your own, I wanna be sure we have enough time to get through the second part and then also open it up for questions. But one of the things, if you're brainstorming, these are some great prompts just to, I remember free writing is about just, and you got like a lot of time, I know I'm speaking from experience, some of these essays and things, I mean, I can tell you I procrastinated like nobody's business. Um, but so sometimes you just gotta do it. You gotta sit down, you gotta set a timer if, if that's helpful for you and just start writing, um, doesn't matter what comes out. And that'll help you start to get comfortable with some of these topics, right? But if you're in the revision stage, I encourage you to reread your draft 
and see if you're demonstrating your interest. Not saying I'm interested in, but if you're showing it through stories, was there a research project that you had? Was there a particular um, experience you had volunteering? Did you sit with a kid who like, you know, demonstrated to you that, or did that experience demonstrate to you that you wanted to go into, I don't know, child psychology? Um, can you tell that story instead of saying, I want to do this, can you tell a story so that the reader understands and really can feel that, that interest? And is it descriptive and specific enough? These are the things that I think students struggle with the most. What questions do we have at this point? How's everybody doing? Good. If we were in person, I would maybe pass out candy now, I don't know, or a stress ball. Um, okay. What questions? I know we have, um, we had one question and you're gonna follow up with me personally, that's perfectly fine. Any other questions, you're welcome to follow up with me directly. You can schedule an appointment. If you want me to review a draft, me or any of my colleagues, this is what we do. Does anybody have a question at this point? All right, we're gonna shift gears. Okay, CV, do most of you have to write a CV or some of you needing to submit resumes? So I'm focused kind of on CVs, but really, let's see, what's we got? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty typical. I know some master's programs in business and some others want, want resumes. Okay, so for your CV. So when we think about a resume, so when we think just broadly about writing a CV, everything that goes into writing a resume pretty much applies. So you wanna look at consistency, you wanna look at format. Um, you know, if you, your bullet points, if you have periods after them, then have periods after all of them. Consistency is key in terms of how it looks. Um, but obviously for a resume, they tend to be much briefer, one to two pages. Um, whereas for a CV, you have a lot more choices. Um, and remember that this is just like your resume, but your CV will grow with you. So uh, there's not a, I'm not, I don't think, you know, all of you should have a three page or a two page or a four page. It just depends on what your experiences have been. You also want to tailor it. Um, I think this is something I'm guilty of where I'm not sure I've tailored it much before. I've just like, just kind of like done it. And then I'm just like, well, it can be long. So I'll just send the whole thing. But remember, just like for resumes, you know, somebody may not be spending an hour looking at your CV. So you want to highlight the most important things, the things that you feel really demonstrate your ability to do the work. Um, okay, so like I said, this is something that'll grow with you. So we have, and we're going to look at an example in a moment, but we have obviously identifying information, <clears throat> educational background, um, and then professional experience. And that's where you have lots of options about what you can, what you can put in. So some of the categories, you're not at all expected to have all of these, but academic preparation, thesis, internships. And I'm gonna be sending you all a handout, which gives you ideas about um, what you can include. Some of these are obvious, like publications and thesis, those make sense. But for things like academic service, I know I was like a doc student. I was a, well, that was in my grad school. Okay. But if you are a student rep or you are, if there's anything you're doing in leadership that could go there. Um, foreign study, obviously study abroad kinds of things, memberships, conference presentations, poster presentations, but also conference conferences you've attended, any membership affiliations you have. So anyway, the handout will go over like what can go in each of these. Cause I, this can be just like, wait, what do you mean? Like, and if you don't have all this, that's certainly fine. This is like something you'll continue to grow. So I don't want you to feel like you're expected to have all of this, not at all. 
But do think broadly, spend some time brainstorming. What have you done? What research experiences? What leadership experiences? What classes? What projects? What service activities? Volunteer? All right. We'll have this, you'll have this example as well. Um, you know, so it looks, you know, on, at the top, everything looks good. I would encourage a LinkedIn. Um, you don't need to put your address, those details, <clears throat> your education, and then your, your honors thesis. And one thing that's different about a CV is that you can write in narrative form a little bit. And you don't want to be writing huge, like, multi-paragraph. You still want to keep it succinct, but that's pretty different than a resume. You don't typically have paragraphs on resumes. You, you know, your research interests, your education, your research, and then your research interests. Okay. Uh, and then your experience. Again, bullet points still need to be strong, succinct, using good action verbs, everything like you would have on your resume. Uh, Sandra, that's a good question. I think that's one, Sandra's question is about applying to a very creative, um, here it is. Mm -hmm. so I think for different fields, Sandra, I would invite you to schedule an appointment so that we can talk about this. I feel like that will require some, some different, a different approach. Does that seem like a good, a good thing to do? Maybe schedule a one-on-one -on -one, or I'll also be available after after we finish up here, we can talk a little bit more if you'd like to stick around. Perfect. Okay. So again, you have these experiences that look like they would look on your resume, um, but then you have conference presentations. Again, this is where you can have like small paragraphs if you've done some presentations and also some conference attendance professional affiliations. Any questions about this part? Specific to concerns you have about, yeah. I have a question. So um, on my CV, I think that I have a mix of different like professional talks and like speeches and also some um, conferences all listed together because there's probably only like six of them total. And I just have them listed under, um, I think, like professional development. But I, I was wondering if that also kind of gives the idea that I was someone that like spoke at these different talks, or if it's kind of obvious that these are places that I attended. Because I see that here with this example, it actually specifies like conferences attended. And if that's maybe something that I, I should shift like the heading to. I like conferences attended. I think you, you always want to err on the side of making sure it doesn't seem like, and not that you would do this, but, you know, like embellishing or making it seem like something. So I think conferences attended is actually um, pretty standard. Um, I have that on my, on my Vita as well. I think so that that's what I would, that's what I would do. I think that's perfect. And then if you do, you know, when you do start giving presentations, then you can have that heading of conference presentations or, yeah. And when you're thinking about how you're putting, how you're laying your CV out, be sure that you're highlighting the most important things kind of at the top. You know, everything is obviously reverse chronological order within each section, but then um, how you lay things out is important as well to highlight the most important things. Any other questions? That was a great question. I had a question and it's kind of along the same lines, but I've gone to like, it's not a conference, but it's more like talks related to what I'm applying uh, towards. So with that, would you, would like the, the heading, would you still put like conference uh, attendance or how would, what would you put there instead? So it wasn't a conference, it was just like a, I think I would still put, yep, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kayla. 
Oh yeah, uh, it was just a talk. So it was um, like a series of talks throughout the week, but I happened to go to one that pertained more to like museum studies. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard because you don't want to call it a conference if it's not a conference, but I'm trying to see here. Let me look. Uh, seeing what our, I still would call it like workshop, like workshop, professional workshop attendance, maybe. Is that, how does that sound? Yeah, I think that sounds better. I think actually now I'm thinking about it, I think the actual presentation was considered like a workshop. Like that was one of the titles that they used to describe it. Yeah. So I would maybe just put professional workshop attendance and then list those. Good questions. Any other questions? Hi, this is Sandra. Just a quick question. Sure. I've uh, worked in the entertainment industry um, quite the much. So I'm just wondering in, within the application process, which it's really necessary to have some experience. It really works for you, but yes. not to do so much name dropping or overkill when it's required, but you don't want to come off too strong by doing, by saying too much. I, just to think about how to, how, how do I apply that within the balance? So not wanting to list all of it. Is that what you're saying on your CV? Do, yeah, I have a lot of it there, but. Well, and that's okay. I think one thing, I think, I think we get to tailor these. So you get to choose what goes on your resume. I mean, I mean, on your CV and your resume, I think mm -hmm. sometimes we forget that. So um, it doesn't have to be everything you've ever done. And that's not, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. So I think maybe just picking out those that you feel like will, will help in what grad program you're trying to get into. And I think highlight those. Good questions. All right, let's see, where are we? How do I get back? Let's see, I think I do this. Yep. All right. Ah, we're back to questions. Okay. So <clears throat> what questions do people have at this point? Um, I had a question. I was wondering, like on a CV, um, cause I've done some things relevant to what I want to study for graduate school, but through my classes. So I was wondering how do we put, um, like, should we put that under experience or like another heading of like relevant coursework to highlight that we do have experience, but it's through our coursework rather than like outside experience. Yeah, I think you can do that a couple of different ways. I think it depends on what it was. Um, if it really was like what you learned in, in a class, then I would do the relevant coursework. If there's something that you, if there's something more that came from it, then I think I would put it under experience. Does that make sense? Like if there were projects, if there's more that you can add to that, then I think I would go ahead and put it in experience or look at some of the other categories. Um, so, you know, you you really have a lot of leeway and you're going to see on this on this handout like you can put so much on academic background academic training field work i mean there's so many different categories so i think it just depends on what it was was it something pretty extensive in a class that you did uh yes yeah, so in the class we it took we were basically doing this on our own for the whole semester but we had to plan out an exhibition um, we had to make a proposal and then plan out an exhibition for, um, it could be like an imaginary museum, or it could have been like a proposal for a museum that currently exists. Yeah, that sounds like an extensive project. I definitely think you could either look at the categories under academic, when, when you see the handout, you'll see what I'm talking about, but there's academic preparation. So you could either put it there, you could put it under professional competencies, you could put it under academic accomplishments, or you could put it under experience. So there are a lot of there are a lot of choices. There's no one right way um, to do a CV. You have you have several different options. 
But like I said, if it was just taking a course and not that taking a course isn't a lot, but that might be where you'd list like relevant courses. But if there was a project, go ahead and, and make that a bigger, a bigger entry on your CV, especially if it's related to what you're trying to do, which it sounds like it's definitely related. There's actually a section on exhibits or um, exhibitions. Um, it's under publications, but I think you could, you, you, know, you can also be creative here where you can have different categories. Like you could make a category for that particular project. Got another question too. I created an extensive project during an internship. Would it go under work experience? No, I, I hate to have the cop out, it depends. But I think it depends on what you're trying to, to, to highlight. Like, and what does your CV look like overall? Are there themes? Are there skills that you're missing that if you, if you made a section about this particular project, would that cover? Do you have other projects like this? So that's one thing I would encourage you to think about is kind of take a look at your CV overall and think about, are, you, are there skills that you're not showing somehow or you're not highlighting how well developed they are? Um, so I, I think it depends. I think you could do either. I think it depends on what you're trying to focus on. Is, it, is that clear as mud, Michaela? Okay. And these are beautiful and detailed questions. I love it. And hopefully it's, oh yes, Sandra? Oh yeah, just another question. Mm -hmm. As everyone's speaking, I've started brainstorming and thinking of, I've taught some classes in regards to like acting classes and production classes. Um, where would I, how would I uh, gear that? Where would I put that? How do I phrase it? I'm just kind of not knowing what to do with that information. Well, I think, um, I think you could either, see again, it depends. You have choices. You could either put it in your experience section or if there's some reason you, you want to highlight it, which no, it seems to me like that would be something I would want to highlight. And it also depends, but there's a, you can have a teaching experience section. Um, so if you don't have that anywhere else on your resume, on your, on your Vita, I would, I would encourage you to highlight that, especially if it applies to what you're going to be studying, or if there's something about that, that you can connect with your pursuit of the graduate degree. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Other questions? Ah, stress management. The psychologist in me can't let you go without just reminding you, and I know I don't need to remind you um, that this is a really challenging time like to be wrapping up the semester transitioning um, into a new phase which will hopefully for for all of you be grad school if that's what you want um, into your top programs um, so there's a lot going on and and like as if the world hasn't been stressful enough right um, so take care of yourselves and and I mean that in a in a very real way um, you know, think about what you need to get through this next push, because I imagine for many of you, there is going to be a push that is going to be two, two pronged, at least two pronged. I don't know what else is going on in your life, but getting through final exams and getting through grad applications, right? Um, so this really matters, taking care of yourself. And it's also something that is going to be super important in grad school. Um, you know, grad school is is hard. I mean, it's so many things, but it's hard and it's long um, and developing good habits now can be, can be really vital. Making sure you have a support system as well. So friends, family, other people who understand 
grad school, grad school applications, grad school process. My two very best friends of 20 years, one of them I'm seeing this weekend. We're going to a lake house and we're going to have a nice uh, girls weekend, but um, I could not have gotten through grad school without her. Find your people, find your people. Um, and I don't just mean mentors and all that. I just mean people, people who can help you, who stay up uh, late into the evening and read your things and um, who just understand what you're going through right now. Okay. So make sure that you're accessing all of the resources that you're paying for, you are paying for. Um, career services offices in your college, um, the University Writing Center, that is absolutely what they're there for, to read your drafts and multiple drafts. And most you know, students who wanna to go to grad school, I know you're all very high achieving, but it's also okay to go with something that is, is very imperfect. That's what they're there for. If you need some, if, you're, if you hit a, hit a block, if you've got writer's block, um, whatever you need, we can help you. The writing center can help you no matter what phase you're in. Texas Career Engagement, that's where I work. Um, we have career coaches, career counselors like myself who have grad student planning appointments. We have personal statement writing. We have CV writing appointments. So you'll see on Handshake how you can make appointments with all of us and you can make multiple appointments. So there's lots and lots of help. Um, I'll send this out, but there's just lots of, lots of other resources on campus and wanted to be sure you had um, the links to them as well. The financial wellness office I always throw on here because I think, you know, figuring out what you can afford, getting some help. They have one-on-one -on -one financial counseling over there. The Office of Distinguished and Postgraduate Scholarships has information for letter writing, uh, recommendation letter writers. There's stuff on scholarships. It's a good resource as well. I think I went, I think I went over this. I do not have anything else for you, but I have a lot of things to send you. I have two long handouts for you. Um, I'll send you the slide deck and, and the recording. It'll be a couple of days because I'll we'll put it up on YouTube. And um, <clears throat> if you want to rewatch it, you can. If not, totally fine. Um, but what last, does anybody have any last questions, comments, thoughts? I have a quick question. There's no like limit to the number of appointments we can make, right? Not, not with us, okay. not with TCE, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, I mean, the writing center might have, might have some limits, okay. um, but that'll be on their, in, on their information, but, but not with us. Okay, great, thank you. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few moments and just giving me a little bit of feedback, um, that would be awesome, um, and I'll stick around, you're all, you're obviously welcome to, to head out and take care of all the things I know you have to take care of, but it's been a pleasure talking with you all and I'll stick around if you have any, anything you wanted to talk with me about uh, privately. So take good care. Best of luck, really. I'm still here. Okay. Atia. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. All right.